So welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Excited to see everyone this fine morning uh, or afternoon if you guys are tuning in elsewhere around the world. Um, we're excited today to invite a friend of ours who actually we had interviewed on a previous podcast of ours a while back. And uh, he belongs to a, an organization called uh, Counselors of Real Estate. Uh, he's the chair this year. And every year they release a list of the top 10 risks affecting commercial real estate and today I thought it would be a great uh, discussion to be able to share uh, on the platform uh, because, again, we're, we're all commercial real estate professionals and we need to be aware of what's going on in our own backyard and also around the world. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. It's always great to see you. Thanks, Rafael. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and to uh, to meet with you again. Absolutely. It's always good to talk. And I know we had a really good conversation a while back on eminent domain, which I know you uh, – are kind of that's your purview in, in in your neck of the woods, and uh, you know I'm excited to kind of switch gears a little bit to talk a little bit about a little bit more I would say of a broader topic, but I think is extremely important to uh, CRE professionals around the world. So uh, I guess let's start out. I mean, so what what was the impetus? First off, I guess let's explain a little bit about what you know the CRE designation is, and a little bit about the background of the organization, and then we'll dive into the the nitty gritty of the actual list. Okay. So the Councils of Real Estate uh, has been around for almost 75 years. It is a um, an invitation-only organization that has about 1,000 members around the world. Uh, we are represented, I believe, in 22 countries. Uh, and our members uh, work in more than 60 different disciplines within the real estate industry. So even though you, know, you mentioned eminent domain, I, I'm just a lawyer. I do eminent domain work. Um, of our thousand members, maybe 50 to 100 of them are lawyers, even though we're called counselors. We have people in, in every facet of the real estate industry um, that are represented in the organization. And um, one of the, I, I think, unique things about it is that because we represent a cross section of just about every kind of real estate professional, we believe that our ability to think through and solve real estate problems is unparalleled because we have access to top people in just about every profession, whether it would be finance, brokerage, asset management, uh, law, planning, architecture, engineering, um, you know, you name it. Um, we, we, we have people uh, that are uh, involved in the organization that uh, help each other and provide each other with opportunities to get information and referrals. And um, it's a, a really wonderful place. Uh, we just had our annual meeting in New York City with about 200 of us and uh, really nailed, I think, everything that's going on in the real estate industry right now um, in a uh, combination of educational programming. Uh, we uh, And also out of, out of the hotel stuff, we did, I think, 18 tours of development sites around the uh, New York area. Uh, and we also um, included in our programming two different uh, assignments for what we call the Counselors of Real Estate Consulting Corps, which is um, members who will volunteer their time and go around the country to help a uh, either a public agency or a nonprofit or an educational institution solve a real estate problem. I'm going to be near you, I think pretty close to you in December in Evansville, Indiana, uh, where we are putting a team together to help that city solve a real estate problem with respect to a portion of its downtown. So um, that, that's a, in a nutshell what the council represents. Um, I'll, I'll get to the top 10 in a minute, but if you had any questions about the organization itself, I'm happy to answer them. No, yeah, no, I, I, I find it fascinating because I did a little bit of research on the organization previously, and, I, and I've heard of the, the Councils of Real Estate as an organization. It's obviously a very well-respected organization. To your point, there's only a thousand members and it's an invitation-only type of organization. So the caliber of individuals that you're surrounding yourself with is of, is of the high utmost. So- You'd mentioned related to helping municipalities with different projects. Is that kind of an, not necessarily an obligation of the organization, but its members do get together to be able to go on site to different areas and try to support uh, the broader uh, mission of trying to, I, I guess, could you describe a little bit about maybe that area of the uh, organization? Sure. Sure. I, I think other than what we do individually in our own communities, uh, we band together our members um, in a variety of different ways uh, that could be on a regional basis. Uh, or, uh, as I said, this consulting core is an, is an opportunity where I'm going to be uh, teamed up with people from other parts of the country. Um, and we, we think that there's synergies in, in that Um bringing in people from the outside who can have a different view. We also have a foundation which provides grants uh, to, um, uh, to, again, government agencies, 
educational institutions, nonprofits. Um, as an example, um, we will probably be sending a team uh, down to um, Central Florida uh, after what's going on right now, today and yesterday. We've been to uh, Sa the Sanibel Island, Cape Coral area after the hurricane that uh, that, that was there recently. We, we sent a team out to Paradise, California, where they had wildfires that destroyed almost the entire town um, a few years back. And I think that team was out there two years ago to try to help them understand how to rebuild their town. And when you can bring together, whether it be a, a, a finance professional or a development professional or a brokerage professional or urban planning professional, sometimes we have members who are involved in academic roles that have access to different kinds of resources. And um, the sustainability issue is, is a big one. We have a, a webinar um, at 1.30 today, uh, excuse me, at 1 p.m. today on sustainability uh, in commercial real estate. And um, these are really um, awesome ways in which information sharing um, can help people. And sometimes there are clients that pay us to, for what we do. We're, we're consultants. Other times we're volunteering our time and providing our expertise at no charge to the constituents, whoever they may be. Yeah, that, that's great. That's a great point. And, and you kind of teased about one of the issues that we'll be discussing uh, on the list uh, pertaining to sustainability. So, you know, I guess the next question I had was related to what 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 was the impetus for starting the list? You know, the way I, again, I, I don't know the history of it, but I read the list and kind of got familiar with the different items on it. And it seems like contributors to that list, they're part of the organization and it's multidisciplinary. So you have people from all different industries that, that share their insights on the matter. Um, I would imagine most of those individuals, I didn't individually go through their bios, but I'd imagine that they're experts in that individual space so they can provide unique insights into the actual topic. So could you kind of give us an idea of what was the impetus for starting the list? And then we'll kind of go through each item and try to see if we can garner some insights from each one. Sure. Um, we've been doing it. I think this is the 13th year. It might be the 12th. Uh, and we felt that it was a way for us to take our strength, which which I believe is our knowledge and our thought leadership on different issues in real estate, pull together uh, a committee uh, which has about 10 members. And on an annual basis, they start usually in January. Uh, they will get together. Uh, they are uh, selected as a cross section of the membership as to areas of expertise and geography. We always have some of our international members involved because there's a lot of different things going on in different countries um, with real with respect to commercial real estate and real estate issues. Um, and then they will identify a larger list of things that they think are important and relevant given the times. Uh, they will then send out a, a survey to our members and collect that information and meet again, and then they refine it, and then they rank them. So each year, we release the list. It's usually in the fall. In, in prior years, um, it might have been done in the spring because we try to do the, um, um, the the reveal of the list when we have our annual meeting with our, our board and our constituents and our guests. And um, we've now moved the uh, the annual meeting into the fall as a regular time. So that's when we release it. So it's a it's essentially a recap of what's going on and a forecast of what's to come in the next year. So this is the 2024, 2025 top 10 uh, issues affecting real estate. Uh, the, the two chairs of the committee are um, a professor from NYU's uh, Shack Real Estate Program named Tim Savage and a woman from Chicago, Maureen Ehrenberg, who runs a very multifaceted, large multifaceted consulting firm uh, in the Midwest, um, has received just a, virtually every honor you can receive in real estate. So they met with the members. They found out what was on their minds. At least one of them um, covered each of these subtopics and was principally responsible for it. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about them, but there are, are, are lots of different kinds of information about them on our website, cre.org. If you just search top 10 cre.org, you'll, you'll pull up a, a summary. There might be a, an article about it. There might be other resources that link you to other materials if you're interested in it. And hopefully, uh, if, you, if you like to go and do some research about things that affect your business, this will give you a head start on some things and give you access to some information. And you can contact the people who wrote the articles. Uh, they're willing to talk to you about it. And um, th that's one of the things that we pride ourselves in. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I, I do encourage you guys to actually read the full article. It, it is is dense with information. It's, it's very unique insights into topics that are very pertinent to our day-to-day -day. and you know as professionals and i can speak from the brokerage space 
we are advocates or really uh, advisors to our clients. So being able to be aware of what's going on around us and being able to relay that information in a in a digestible format to our clients is only going to benefit us and, and our clients, which ultimately will ensure that we continue to add value. So um, I guess let's, uh, if you're open to it, let, why don't we just go down the list of different items and you know see if we can kind of have some discussion uh, on that. And, and if you guys are watching this live or listening to this live, feel free to type away in the chat box if if you have some you know things you'd like to maybe discuss about and at the end we'll address with questions sure let's dive in um let's start with number 10 it's the price expectations gap so mm -hmm. um what we mean by that is that we believe that buyers and sellers of, of real estate are still in somewhat of a standoff when it comes to asset pricing uh we do believe however that the gap is narrowing and and uh, even the recent um, reduction in interest rates by the Fed may have an impact on that going forward, that there are these expectations from the, the uh, hot real estate market that we have for so many years when the cost of debt was basically free, uh, that the market was healthy and strong. And a lot of the trades that occurred in the past 15 years represented some of the most healthy real estate prices and the, the best sellers market we've ever seen in our lifetimes. Um, prices started to fall, obviously, as things changed. And um, the sellers still were expecting top dollar for their properties and the buyers were looking to bottom feed and, and to get good deals. Um, and that led to a standoff. And, and as many of us know, there has not been a ton of market activity compared to prior years because of that. So um, uh, every sector has been affected in different ways. I think maybe the industrial sector was affected the least because of uh, the influence of the uh, pandemic on um, on supply chain and logistics. Uh, people were buying, their buying habits were different. You needed to store your goods somewhere. You needed to ship them differently. So that market still was affected though. Uh, just, a, just the increase in a cap rate, right? Which might be the result of um, either higher interest rates or higher vacancies in some regional uh, areas um, or a different pricing of the, of the rents or uh, this comes back to some of the other issues we're going to be talking about, increased expenses. What if your labor costs more? Your insurance has gone up. Your property taxes got, have gone up. That makes your, your net operating income lower for an investment property and the value is lower. So, so um, we, we do believe that there's still a, a component of the market in different sectors, office probably being the most uh, significantly affected and industrial least, um, where that gap still exists. Uh, but it's still on our minds. It's still something we're watching. And we think as the year progresses, uh, especially if there's another movement downward on on the cost of the debt, uh, you'll start to see that gap narrow even more. So that's number 10. Yeah, no, that's great. And and I, and I can speak to my own experiences thus far in, in, the, in the space over the last year and a half, I'd say that that gap is starting to narrow. Uh, but a lot of the discussions that we've been having with owners, that's 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 the hurdle you often have to overcome is that you know, you have a conversation with an owner say, oh, we were getting unsolicited offers for this amount. And now you're saying that my, my property is worth this. And if you're talking about some of these property types, like an old multifamily or industrial that were hot property types back then, they're still maintaining a strong rent amount. So if you don't need to sell, there's no reason to sell. And so a lot of sellers are choosing not to. And so I do believe to your point that things are going to modify over the next year and a half as rates start to dip down again. And It'll be good for the transactional market for sure, especially for those brokers who are looking for 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 good deal flow that they haven't had in a while, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leasing's been big though. Leasing's been yeah, active, but but has. yeah, you're 100 percent right. The, the the investment sales market has been down. I think over 50 percent in some areas. All right, so move move on to number nine, or move mm -hmm. down to number nine, should I say? Yeah, yeah, down to number nine. I guess we're going up the list, so maybe up to number nine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what you're going to see as we go through this, there's so much interrelationship between these different things. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, you can't isolate any one issue in any business, but especially our business, where it's a team sport. There are a lot of different people involved, a lot of issues involved in every deal, every transaction, every decision, right? So number nine is the um, elephant in the room, I think, which is the office vacancy elephant. And... Um, how it affects the urban core, the suburban areas, and the tax base. Um, there are reports that the overall vacancy rate for office is about 20% this year. I think it's higher here in the Northeast and the New York area. Um, and there are obviously have been a lot of structural shifts in uh, workplace formation, uh, workplace design, behavior, and that has had significant ripple effects on the office market. Um, it affects owners, lenders, investors, 
uh, it affects the health of the office areas, wherever you are. Um, my shorthand to this, it may not uh, be applicable around the country, but in the New York uh, area where I am, um, in the cities, we seem to be finding ways and hopefully we'll continue to find ways to rehabilitate and, and redevelop office properties. In the suburbs, we tend to be knocking them down to redevelop them. And the, and the suburban office markets, at least um, in the uh, New York Beltway area, because my, you know, my, my, my home and, and work area is northern New Jersey, about 25 miles west of Manhattan. Um, we have tons and tons of Class A office product that you'll drive around and still see the parking lots half empty or more, which means that the, the offices probably are more than 20% vacant. Even beautiful Class A buildings with lots of amenities, um, it's not uncommon to drive by them one day and the next day see the wrecking ball out. Mm -hmm. um, and what are they building there? Two things predominantly, either mixed use uh, multifamily, sometimes with an affordable housing component, or secondly, uh, you're knocking down an office building and making a warehouse. And then what's happening on a local standpoint is the municipal officials are getting pushback from their voters saying, I live in that area. This is my backyard. I don't want the trucks for a warehouse in my backyard. I didn't mind having an office building, but I don't want you to put warehouses there and manufacturing operations there. It's not good for my kids. It's, it's near a playground, whatever it is. So there's some pushback. Um, but what happens when these properties that used to be worth, let's say there was a building that was worth $100 million. And, and now for whatever the reasons are, and some of the reasons we'll talk about in our other uh, top 10 items, um, the building trades for $30 million. What happens? Well, that building was contributing jobs, commerce in the area, all right? Um, and um, people going and buying a sandwich or getting their clothes cleaned or whatever, they don't go to work anymore. So that merchant is affected too. And then one of the bigger impacts is what happens to the railroad base, especially in a heavily taxed state like mine or any others in the Northeast or, or on, in, in, in the West. Um, that building may have contributed millions of dollars in tax rateables that goes towards the municipal budget. And now if it gets reassessed based upon the, the trade price, which it might, um, that, uh, that town is losing a significant part of its rateable base. How do they fix that? How do they go and pay the salaries of the police and the fire safety and the, and the, the administrative staff for the towns and the, the public works officials when they don't have money in their budget because there's not enough of a contribution from the rateable base because the rateable base has changed. Even if it comes back down the street from me, I have uh, an area that had two class A office buildings. I think they were about 400,000 feet total. They're, they're in the ground now and they're building apartments there. It'll come back and provide a rateable base. So it's going to take two or three years. Where's that during that gap? Where did the money come from the town and how do they deal with that? So um, how this affects those areas is very, very critical. I think in the cities, we're starting to see more and more um, repurposing that sometimes the, the numbers don't work on their own um, because of what has to be done to change an office building into an apartment building, especially if it's a high rise. It's a lot of physical work, a lot of expense. We're starting to see incentives that are provided by government agencies and by other places to make those ends meet, to make those projects work, and hopefully they will. Yeah. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And another point to, towards the, 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 the office issue is, you know, I, I'm sure it's similar in your market. A lot of city officials and, and people within the municipal government don't necessarily want to see a high rise get demoed. I mean, it, 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 the optics of it tends to be a little bit negative. It's like, well, we have to we have to essentially scrap something and, and go ground up. And, and I know in a city like ours in Louisville, we don't necessarily have the, the same level of density. So knocking down one of these big high rises is going to be a big deal for those individuals that are that are in the municipal area. And so I figure that's that's another reason I would say that it could be an issue, uh, at least in, in smaller cities. Maybe in New York City, it's a common occurrence that things are demoed and there's churn in buildings and such, but in areas like a Louisville or other smaller municipal markets, maybe that's also a factor. So, so let's go mm. to the next one. Number yeah. eight. Um, very, very uh, relevant, especially today. Sustainability. I mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's nothing new for our industry. Uh, we've been focusing on energy efficiency and green buildings for decades. We have new classes of professionals, lead certified professionals. Those types of things are, uh, important for a lot of reasons. Number one, um, we see what has happened 
and what is happening because of extreme weather events. And it's not just extreme weather, it's just the way in which the energy is handled and processed to be more efficient. Uh, those things are taken into account in the design and the layout of the properties, how they're operational, how they're rehabilitated. Uh, government incentives have helped. I, I, I know that um, there have been programs around for probably 20 or 30 years in my state to bring in more and more solar. Just, just that issue. Forget about you know sustainability from a standpoint of of weather protection. Um, but we are feeling growing pressures to better understand our carbon footprints, to engage in decarbonization. I think our friends in in Europe are ahead of us on that. They already have um, incentives and they have regulations in place for reporting and disclosures on real estate assets. We have some recommendations in, in the United States. I'm not sure they'll become law because of politics, and I'm not going to get political other than to say that there's a process by which ideas can become law and they don't always become law for a variety of reasons. So whether there's climate reporting changes for us or not, it's here. It's in our industry. It affects investment decisions. It affects the bottom line. Um, and we have to find ways to make our real estate more resilient. Um, you know, if, if you have, unfortunately, a, a home or a commercial property in an area, whether it be in Florida or um, in the uh, the foothills in North Carolina and Tennessee that were devastated by Hurricane Helene, you're going through this. You're seeing how this is something that has to be dealt with in a more proactive way. And going forward, we think the challenges are going to continue to mount. We have to find more and more solutions for them, and we have to incorporate them into our thinking and how we build, develop, and rebuild. Absolutely. No, no, no doubt. And I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick comment before we move on to the next one regarding uh, there's there's opportunities to learn more about some of these things. Michael Beckerman, if you're familiar, he's he runs CRE Tech, which they usually have conferences in New York City. And I believe they had one in Denmark. They usually do one in Europe and they usually do one in the United States. And I would highly encourage you guys to if you're in the area, check out those conferences. They do have a they, he, he Michael Beckerman started another um uh, confer or organization that focuses strictly on the climate piece of, of commercial real estate. And it's, it's super, uh, thoughtful, thought provoking, a lot of the things that they share. So just thought I'd share that comment, but looking forward to the next, uh, item on the list. So the next one is AI or artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, since I'm kind of an old guy, it's something that I can only understand at a very granular uh, level. Um, this is a tough one because I, I, I think it's evolving in every facet of our lives. Uh, real estate is a very data heavy industry um, and the the, the the data sources that we have can be measured, interpreted, um, summarized probably more efficiently by artificial means than by uh, individual uh, human means. Um, we're starting to see the impacts of it in um, the finance sectors. We're seeing it in the investment sectors where artificial intelligence is helping investment decisions. Um, appraisal fields are affected by it. Um, but um, we look at it in this way. Like anything else, there's a phrase, um, garbage in, garbage out. If the inputs aren't accurate, if they're not reliable, the, the stuff that's getting spit out to you is also equally unreliable or perhaps more unreliable because it's interpreting incomplete, inaccurate, or false information. And then there may be a, a confluence of all those analyses together that results in a, in a um, set of information that's just dead wrong. But that being said, we're getting better at it. Uh, I mentioned we have professionals and organizations that are um, involved in the academic world and, and they teach this stuff and they're at the cutting edge of it. So we have to look to how we can use this information better. Um, one of the things that I heard recently I thought made a lot of sense to me. It was at a conference and it said artificial intelligence, if you're in the real estate business, isn't going to take your job. But the person who knows how to use artificial intelligence better than you probably will take your job, right? Think about that. Take that thing, take that ability to integrate human brain power and the brain power of a computer system, marry it, see how it works efficiently together, and then come out with a, a way to be more efficient in what you do, more accurate in what you do, and more reliable in what you do. So watch out. I think it, you're going to see every you know year, certainly, and, and maybe every few months, new ways that artificial intelligence is coming into our industry or industries and affecting us. That's awesome. No, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And, and there's a lot of resources out there to learn more about uh, the different technologies that are coming available. Obviously, ChatGPT is a big part of that, but integrating 
your, you know, chat GPT with some other platforms as well in your, if you're a broker or an attorney or whatever else, there, there are different ways you can leverage these platforms to then amplify your result or am, amplify what you can do on a day to day. So definitely something to consider as you go forward. So, all right. So next up. Number six, housing affordability and attainability. Uh, this is not a, a local problem. This is a national and perhaps international problem. Uh, it's been persistent and the lack of affordable housing is, I think, getting worse, not better. Uh, we, we have a shortfall of four to five million housing units in this country, and that's not affecting the luxury market. There are still buyers out there for those, and, and, and the sellers are happy about them, right? But it's those workforce folks. Where do they live? Can they afford to rent something? Can they afford to buy something? How do you come up with the down payment? Um, every state, since it's a local issue, has tried its own solutions. In my state, as an example, we have um, zoning incentives and legal incentives, and they're enforced by our courts. Um, so that if you, um, if you have a piece of property and you wanna build affordable housing, you can force the town to let you by going to court. Because if the town doesn't have enough of it, there's a there's a formula that's used, and then there's a big list and a spreadsheet with all this data. And if the town is short on its affordable housing supply, and you can supply it, you can get help from the courts to force the town, the mayor, the governing body to allow you to do it, regardless of what the zoning is. So we talk about these inclusionary projects in my area, which are typically 80% market rate units and 20% affordable units. That can make a dent in things, but it's not enough. And I think we have to look to ways that we can increase opportunities to provide affordable housing for low and moderate income uh, individuals around the country uh, because they are the ones who make our engines go economically. They are the workforce, right? You open up a new factory somewhere in a, in a state like yours, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the Carolinas, um, you got a, new, a, a whole new population coming in. Where are they going to live? Can they afford the houses that are there? Are there enough of them? There aren't probably. So finding ways to do that, it's going to require public and private sector um, effort, uh, you know, together, like most things. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll start to see how that works. The, there was a um, an oversupply of housing during the great financial crisis because there was a lot of build and, and then no sales because no one can get a mortgage. That's been gobbled up. We now have um, seen um, a, a supply of multifamily coming on market in the past couple of years because people were borrowing, borrowing, borrowing for nothing and building and building and building. There's not that many of those that are workforce housing, mm -hmm. right? So we still have a shortfall. And now that in the past year and a half or two, since interest rates started going up, there's less construction activity. There's gonna be a plateau or a shortfall that's gonna increase in the next couple of years. So we're watching that carefully. We're watching it come. We need to figure out ways that we can um, put some dents into it around the country so we can help our, our Americans find places to live. Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. And, and to your point regarding the, the the luxury market, I feel like a lot of developers that I've talked to in my market and other even regional markets, it, the only way you can really make sense of something is if you build something that's going to require you to have market to a cli higher clientele, a higher income clientele, I should say, unless you have some of these incentives to make these types of developments work. And a lot of issues that we faced, at least in our market, is that there's a lot of nimbyism per pertaining to the affordable housing uh, developments. Nimbyism meaning not in my backyard, for those who don't know the terminology. But, you know, it's it's a lot of neighbors and neighborhoods that are coming together to kind of fight against developers that are that are wanting to develop in a certain area. And as a result, they're not able to achieve whatever desired zoning there is or, you know, they're not getting the incentive packages they need to from a, from a municipal level. And so, you know, it's 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 a multifaceted approach to kind of serve, to, to be able to provide the inventory that's going to be required going forward. So I thought I'd share that uh, insight as well. But it's, uh, uh, you know, you can think about different ways to solve the problem. One way is if it's a, an area that has um, multifamily development that can be mid rise to high rise, if the if the private sector knows that it's not really making money with an 80%, 20% split, right? That the 20% affordables are kind of a wash. Maybe they don't lose money on them, but they make money on the 80. So if they're giving you 20%, if you're, and you're the governing body, they're giving you 20% of those 100 units, let's say, to be affordable. Why not, instead of letting them build 100, let them build 120, mm -hmm. right? And they can go up and recapture some extra value. So there's incentive there. It's not a check from the government, it's zoning relief that mm -hmm. can help um, a project pencil out 
that can get the private sector more motivated to do it, and it gives a benefit back to the community. That's the idea behind it. That's awesome. Great chair. All right. So number five, um, insurance costs. Um, I um, I have a, a home in Southeast Florida um, that um, I saw in a year. I saw the the uh, the hazard insurance for that home increase by about seventy percent in one year. Um, these things affect our homes. They affect these costs affect our investments. Um, they affect the bottom line if it's an investment property in a significant way. And in after debt, insurance and property taxes, I think are the two big line items in, in any commercial real estate investment. Um, last year, uh, there were reports that we unfortunately broke records that um, are that there were global natural disasters that topped over 350 billion in economic losses. So the insurance industry reacts to this. They're in business to make money. They won't give you a, um, a policy unless they can underwrite the loss. And with these changing variables, their underwriting has changed. So there are less choices available to you. The only way that you can get insurance is by paying them, the insurance companies more, right? Because they're not going to give you an, an insurance policy if they're going to lose money. Um, I think that going forward, there's going to be um, the need for the private insurance industry to figure out how to underwrite these uh, potential future losses in a better way so that the pricing um, can come back to us in a way where we have more choices, right? Because some insurance companies are leaving markets. They're saying, we're going to lose money there. We're not going to insure it. So what do you do? Can you self-insure? Maybe you can. Maybe you can. It depends upon what kind of asset pool you have. You know, if you've got 100 different investment properties around the country, Maybe you can self-insure them, knowing that the ones in, in flood-prone areas might cost more to repair if there if there is a loss. Um, may, but maybe you can't. So um, we're going to need to focus on that. We're going to need to see the insurance industry's reactions to it. There may need to be incentives from the public sector, just as I said with the affordable housing. Um, and um, and we need to know as an industry how do we more efficiently manage those risks, given the fact that we are in a time of I, I, I think tremendous uncertainty um, and, and risk. And we are in a time that there's an evolution of how we're addressing this, that eventually I think that the economy will figure it out, but it might take years before we come to an equilibrium. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's becoming a big point of contention on the loan side. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously a lot our our, our industry is debt driven and a lot of lenders, all lenders prim primarily will want insurance policies in place prior to closing to, make sure that their investment is protected in the in the asset. And to your point, uh, we're in a market where we are affected by tornadoes. And we've had a lot of really bad tornadoes over the last several years. And it's caused a lot of insurers to leave market. And it's caused a lot of insurers to even reevaluate whether or not they want to renew you for the coming year. And my personal residence, I had, uh, you know, our roof's probably 10 years old or 12 years old. And I guess they drove by the house or something and saw that there was some moss on, on the roof. And they my insurance agent called me. She said, Hey, if you don't fix that, like pretty soon, we're going to drop you. And I was like, Oh, wow. Like, I can't believe that they're doing that. But again, insurance companies are in the business of making profits. And if in fact you're a higher risk for them, they're willing to drop you. So, uh, just thought I'd share that insight, but the only other thing I'll mention about it is that it doesn't only affect the, um, the, the hazard insurance it affects the, the casualty or liability insurance sure. market too. Mm -hmm. All your premiums are going up. Right. And, and that, you know, if you own an apartment building, you're paying more for the hazard insurance, you're paying more for your liability insurance, therefore your bottom line goes down. So again, these things are all interwoven. We have to look at them in a very holistic uh, sense, and we have to be able to try to measure how we can deal with them in a more responsible and efficient way going forward. Oh, well, certainly. Okay, number four, uh, geopolitics and regional wars. Um, I can't remember the last time I, I watched the news and didn't hear about a war somewhere else in the world. Um, that affects us in a lot of ways. It affects us uh, in, in one way because people internationally look to the American market as a safe haven for investments. So if things are unsettled wherever they are, they're more likely to put money here. And and if what are they going to put money in? What are the safest investments? Typically real estate, right? Uh, typically, not, not always. but um, So it, it affects the inflow investment. Uh, it affects policy decisions that are made relating to trade. Uh, I remember when I was um, a, a teenager, we we had um, 
we had strife in the Middle East like we have now. It affected the uh, market for oil products. I remember uh, when I first got my driver's license, we were waiting in line to get gas because they were rationing it because there wasn't any supply. It affected that, right? Today, it could affect the shipping routes because they might close the Suez Canal. And uh, all of these things have ripple effects here. They have effects um, in, in our real estate markets and our uh, real estate industry and, and good real estate investors and market participants have always understood that you can make good investments in, in bad markets and you can make bad investments in good markets. And those kinds of investment decisions are heightened where the risks are higher. So are you gonna, are you gonna invest overseas? When there's a war there, wherever you're talking about, are you going to take investments from overseas investors who are in a period of strife? Are you? What role are they going to have in your projects? Um, we have to keep a careful eye on these things. The world's getting smaller because of technology and transportation abilities. And, um, and that means that we are all interconnected in how we do things, um, just like we were at the beginning of the pandemic when we couldn't find toilet paper, right? Mm -hmm. You couldn't find certain products and you saw pictures of the boats queuing up in Long Beach, California, in the Pacific Ocean to try to get into the port, right? Maybe if there's a war, that's going to happen again, and it's going to affect us and how we do things here. Yeah, 100%. And now you have talk of tariffs and other things that are going to affect the way that supply chain, if everything flows through the supply chain, and that mean, may mean that markets that were receiving certain products that you know, there's sub industries that evolve around it now may be affected by the fact that maybe there, there's not as much exporting uh, at that in that area. So it, all these different it, it's amazing how interwoven our societies have become. And so it's definitely something to consider um, going you, forward. You know, year, years ago, Raphael, I, I remember when I was younger, um, at least in my area, the real estate investment community seemed to be very localized. And mm -hmm. maybe there were funding sources that came from outside. But, you know, you knew these were the folks that did that kind of product, whether it's a warehouse or a, an apartment complex or an office building or retail, and they tended to be local or regional. Now they're coming in from everywhere. That's the active participants in the development side. It's the consultants. It's the financing partners. So there's so many different ways that what's going on outside of the United States of America can affect what's going on inside of the United States of America. And to the extent there's unrest um, and, and, and there are uh, wars that are affecting people in other parts of the country, it's going to affect us more here. So that's Absolutely. why it's number four. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, number three. Um, this is the issue of loan maturities and debt repricing. Uh, reports are that there's a, still about a hundred, I think it's $150 trillion of commercial debt that will come due in the next two to five years because it was still cast when things were different and been, depending upon the term, seven to 10 years. Think about that. You know, when does it come due? Um, we, we aren't really making a dent in clearing that debt we have heard and read that there has been um, a lot of loan extension uh, happening because everybody's kind of doing a wait and see. I'm not sure how much longer the the, the lenders can do that uh, and they can wait. Um, the, 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 the fact that the lenders are trying to postpone the maturing debt, I think is, an, is a good sign because it means that they think things are going to come back, but they're not going to go back to where they were, right? I mean, three years ago, if you were selling an office building, what kind of what what kind of interest rate would you see in your area for someone to borrow uh, debt for that? You could just give me an idea where where the range might have been. Yeah, th you mean twenty one? Yeah, yeah. I mean under four percent, probably four, right. Yeah, four percent. I'd say right. that's probably and now like it's probably six fair. and a half to eight, right? Uh, yeah, and, I mean, there's some banks don't even want to touch it, so they won't even. Well, the availability even... of the debt is another yeah. issue. They don't even want to make yeah. those loans anymore. Yeah, because they don't know. They don't know yeah. what's going to happen, but even if there is more easing, it's not going to go back to free money. It's not going to go back to, you know, my, my house. I, I When I bought my house, uh, my first house, my, my mortgage was 12%. Then mm -hmm. I refinanced it to nine and a half. Then I went to seven. Then I went to six. Then I went to four. And the, the debt that I have left on my primary residence is 2.75%. I probably wouldn't have any debt except it was so cheap, right? <laughs> and now that house, if someone wants to buy it, they have to get a 7% mortgage. So obviously those are just really little tiny examples of how it can affect everything. The bigger the project, the more debt's involved, whether it's it's construction debt or permanent debt or mezzanine debt, all of these things are coming due, have come due. Uh, we have rate caps on a lot of deals that you see. Those are expiring soon. Then what happens, right? So um, at some point, 
whether it's a wall or a wave, we're going to start to see more and more of these things so that the deals that you have read about, I, I, I saw one in San Francisco, right? A hundred million dollar property was bought for, I think, 20, right? That's what's going to happen. There's going to be more of that. And then the, the market is going to adapt to this in some ways. There will probably be easing of, of, of the ability to get debt as things you know improve. Um, where the wall hits or when, I can't tell you. I don't know how big it is. I don't think anyone knows, but it's it's upon us. It's happening. And I think over the course of the next year, you're going to see a lot more things like that continue to happen. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, really. So this is actually very, very closely related to number two, which is the cost of financing. Um, we know that our um, our era of free money, which was the product of essentially government policy starting in around 2007 and eight during the great financial crisis, that's over. Um, and it's a tough adjustment. We, we have to understand that the debt costs will be probably higher in the next five to 10 years than they, a lot higher than they have been in the five, five to 10 years um, you know, before that. Um, you know, we, we had a recent uh, cut here. There have been cuts in other countries, Canada, Europe. Um, monetary policy is so important because of how it affects everything. Um, I don't know that there's an answer that will uh, make everything easy for people to understand in the next 12 months. But I think if you keep um, you know, a careful eye uh, on it, there may be more rate cuts to come and then you can decide if you're an investor or you're a, a broker helping with someone with an investment, what kind of debt do you get? Um, what, where do you place your bets? Right. And what kind of real estate is it? What 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 type of maturity cycle does it have? Um, and and then maybe you'll get it right and you'll luck out or you might get it wrong and then you take a bath on that project. So still a very volatile issue. It's going to continue to be volatile over the course of the next year. And that's why it's number two this year. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's the it's the probably the number one topic of clients of mine, I know as a broker is, you know, what do you think about the next six to 12 months as far as the rate environment is concerned? And so you know, and there's so many factors at play outside of just obviously the Fed's a big piece of that, but then there's a broader market that we've just talked about, and in, in you know the geopolitical environment yeah. and how that's going to affect you know investment in in treasuries, and that can drive you know how banks issue debt, and so it's there, it's all inter interwoven. So you know, I, I appreciate the 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 insight there. How about the private it, the private equity huh? markets, right? The, the oh, yeah. family offices, right? 100%. They can buy that that hundred million dollar office building for twenty without borrowing. Yeah, right. But then eventually, if especially if they're going to repurpose it, there is some borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, they might sit and hold because they could. And the private equity, you know, money has come into real estate in ways in the past fifteen years that it it, it infiltrated other industries. Right over the years, whether it was a retail business where um, you know you have a private equity concern that's buying up all the funeral homes around the country, right? Because they view those as good good investments, or pharmacies, or um, or medical practices. Mm -hmm. The real estate industry is certainly affected by that, and and those um, players have a lot of dry powder. And as the as the bottom comes, they see it. They might pounce on something and they may or may not need the traditional debt that most folks need. That will affect the market pricing as well. Absolutely. And you're seeing it all over the country with single family home acquisitions, these large entities like a you know, BlackRock, Blackstone, these these large entities coming in and buying a swaths of property. And I know and I have some friends that uh, operate in the California market. And to your point regarding medical uh, practices. There's a lot of uh, private equity dollars coming in that we're we're trying to acquire a lot of these practices and and buildings and everything else, which was causing a lot of issues on the administration front because they'd come in and and essentially streamline all the processes and fire people and essentially try to maximize the profit they achieve in that in, in that vertical. And and you know it, 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 we can go down the political road, which I'm not going to get down, but but it, but there's been legislation now that's kind of restricted some of those practices because of the impact it could have on the broader society. So you know there's there's all these different moving pieces that again. This is why having this discussion is very in, in, insightful. Um, All right, we ready for number one. Numero uno. Number one is politics in a very broad sense and more specifically global, global and U.S. elections. Right, we have a kind of a big one coming up. Um, and, kind of big uh, one. And <laughs> <laughs> I think it seems like everyone is, right? Yeah, at, they, least, yeah. at, at least in my adult lifetime. Um, but um, 
this one is is really big for a lot of reasons that can bleed down into the real estate industry more than in the past. Um, but it's not just us. I think there's about 70 different countries that have significant uh, national elections this year or, or next year. Um, here, um, we we have to watch very carefully um, whether there will be um, a national effort to put in policies like rent control, which has historically been a local issue. But I've read, I don't know what the truth is, I've read that that's something on the radar of at least one of the parties running for national office. And um, um, that affects the market, doesn't it, if there's rent control? And I'm not saying rent controls are good or a bad thing. I'm just saying that if those things get put into place, if there are caps on multifamily rents, think about how many multifamily investors are affected by that. Think about how their tenants are affected by that. And 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 if you buy something that you are looking to uh, rehab and bring to market and it's not done and then there's rent control put in place, your investment is probably going to tank, isn't it? Right? Because you can't recapture the money you put in to make that unit new by raising the rents anymore because there are caps on that. So that's one issue. Um, another massive one is whether the 1031 like kind exchange will either be eliminated or even affected. And this not only has to do with the presidential election, it has to do with Congress because they make the laws, right? Even if they curb it and they trim it somehow, it affects the pool of investments that are out there that has made our industry tick in so many ways, especially the folks that have been at this a while. That's how they do it, right? They use the 1030, the 1031 mechanism to defer the gain um, and that has uh, spurred economic investment because of their ability to make deals, to sell and buy uh, exchange properties. Um, there's also other obvious ramifications of our elections, both presidential and congressional um, monetary policy, right? How does the mm -hmm. Fed work? What kind of guidance? It's supposed to be independent, but we do believe that it has some influence on the folks who are appointed. Um, um, how Congress looks at other issues, whether they be economic incentives. We had this massive infrastructure bill as an example under President Biden, which I think was good for the economy. Um, look, looking back on it, it hasn't all hit us yet, but we're, we're seeing signs of it. There might be other things that are done to invest um, government money and government initiative and policy and energy in things that will affect the real estate market. So um, again, we come back to how those future events might affect the real estate industry and um, the investment communities. And what we know is that today there's a lot of uncertainty. In a month, there's still going to be a lot of uncertainty because even if there are changes in either the president, the, well, there will be a change in, in the president's office because President Biden is not running. So regardless of who wins, there's going to be a new president, right? A new cabinet, um, new policies probably some changes in in the in, in the house of representatives and or um the senate and um and those kinds of things affect who runs those committees what regulations what laws do they propose do they get passed and enacted or not um and and how does that affect everything that the real estate communities are doing um we all want to have greater clarity i think over the course of the next several months based upon who does get elected you can start to make your bets on what might happen and then make make better informed decisions as to your real estate uh, investments and your real estate decisions going forward. Um, they also, as, as you indicated earlier, even outside of the country, the elections could result in different kinds of trade policies, which could affect us, which could affect real estate. Something as simple as tariffs on certain kinds of products could affect the industrial real estate market here for warehousing, right? Very simple, mm -hmm. right? Shipping, things like that. How we have all this infrastructure investment in our ports, Right. Well, what if things change for the worse? What happens with those pieces of property? Uh, I know that in my area, the cargo container properties during the pandemic doubled or tripled in value, right? Where you stack cargo containers, they mm -hmm. eat at, at minimum doubled in two years, sometimes tripled in value. What happens if there's not much product coming in? Then the, the users of that aren't going to pay as much rent because they don't have as many containers. Your value of that property goes down. So, and that could be affected by an election somewhere else besides here. Um, so that's why it's number one. I think the impact that it can have on the certainly the world, the United States, is probably the broadest concern that we have in our organization, and that's why we gave it the number one billing.
Definitely. No, I appreciate the insight there. And I think it just goes to show the importance of keeping informed about what's going on, both on a federal level and even at, at the state level. Uh, and, and, and I always encourage people to I think it's a civic duty to really put yourself in a position to clearly understand the topics of play. And regardless of where you vote, at least make an educated decision about where you decide you want to you want the country to go. And so, you know, I, I think it's kind of, uh, you know, a good thing that we're doing this even ahead of, of November 5th, uh, which is the election date here in the United States, because at least it gives you guys something to think about. And as you start doing more research on your own, uh, really taking these these matters into consideration because it really is an important piece of our industry so man so that's the top 10 it's that was not great. as good as it's not as good as david letterman's but uh, in the real estate yeah. business we think it's we think it's pretty good <laughs> hey we, we'll drop some jokes at the end here just to kind of round it out i'm sure but that's great oh yeah no and i i really do appreciate sharing that list and we'll give it about a minute or so if you guys are watching this live stream on different platforms feel free to type away in the chat box in the meantime, uh, we'll give it about a minute uh, to to share that because we're near near the top of the the hour as as it as it seems. Um, but one thing I was going to go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, one of the things I, I mentioned earlier is um, this top ten list and the uh, the articles on each of them are available free of charge on our website. Um, there's also um, a publication that we that we have called Real Estate Issues. Um, which covers a lot of these topics. And those things are also linked onto the website. And if you need a source of information, take a look at it. We might have an article written about it. You know, one, one of the articles that was recently published had to do with the build to rent um, mm -hmm. community around and how it's changing the single family real estate market for investors, for users, for occup occupants, um, and for brokers too, right? If you have private equity buying uh, an area where they're going to build, 600 new homes and rent them all it changes things so it's cre.org real estate issues uh, you might find something that you didn't know or that you want to learn more about it's all there take a look at it and then as i said our, our members are always willing to try to provide help to people in the real estate industry um you find something written by someone their contact information is there contact them say you have an interest in this and i'm sure that they'll talk you through it and explain what they meant better than in the article they wrote so definitely no, absolutely. And, and and for those of you guys who are watching this on YouTube or listening to this in a podcast format, it will be in the show, the description. I'll make sure to link to the article and we'll also link to the, the CRE page as well. So you guys can access that information. And again, if you guys have any questions for Anthony or really anyone that's affiliated with the organization, uh, they're readily available to, to have a discussion. So. Well, cool. Well, it looks like you've answered all the questions, Anthony. I mean, obviously, really thank thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be able to share that. I think there's going to be a lot of people who gain some value from the discussion today. If people want to learn more about, you know, the organization or wanted to reach out to you directly, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, one way is to, uh, the organization is just look at the website and there mm -hmm. are ways to find all of our members there with contact information. Um, mine, uh, since my name is long. Uh, you can contact me directly. Uh, email is usually best. And it's A, A de la Pelle, A D E L L A P E L L E at M R O D dot law. That's, that's me. And um, I'm happy to connect with whomever in your audience. And I really appreciate you giving me the chance to uh, meet with you again and to share this information with you and your audience and keep up the good work. No, no. Thank you again for your time. And we'll make sure to include the email in the show notes, but Again, thanks everyone for tuning in today. Obviously, we do this every other week, so please feel free to come back and engage with the the commentary. If you guys like this channel, please like and subscribe. Along with that, if you guys like uh, the the podcast, please leave a five star review. It makes a, a huge impact in our ability to reach a broader audience, and we really do appreciate the support. So, thanks again so much for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time.